uh, today for our main conversation here in Havana, we've got uh, a couple serial entrepreneurs with us. And we're going to talk about something that I don't think St. Louis probably talks about very much. And that's uh, when to walk away or this idea of failure in startups. And most of the serial entrepreneurs I know uh, have a bunch of failures under their belt. Uh, and generally, when we're out having beers, those are the things we talk about the most because those are the ones where you learn the most. So um, we're going to cover a lot of different topics today. It's going to be a very conversational flow. Uh, I think I'm going to start off with a few questions for our panelists here. Uh, we have Patrick Brennan and we have David Schenberg. They're going to introduce themselves in a minute. Um, but I hope you guys have come with questions and, and we want to keep this. I know there's many of you in the audience that have at our serial entrepreneurs and if some of you don't walk away from things and that, that might be uh, why you're also here, just trying to figure out what to get rid of. And, and that is a trait that a lot of entrepreneurs have, it's just not wanting to let go. So, um, you know, I'll start with my own personal stories. I've, I've uh, I guess, failed in a couple different cases, although one of the startups I was in is still going, so I'm not going to name it. But uh, uh, I got involved uh, as an equity partner and helped raise about 100 grand. I uh, came in to manage business operations for the next startup, uh, and things were really exciting as we sailed into 2008, and the recession was sailing right in with us. And uh, so everything that I was going to manage from a business operational perspective, I uh, started getting the phone calls in January of, yeah, we're not going to be doing that penetration test, and that network test we're going to put off. Oh, don't, don't call me back. It's sort of an indefinite thing. We, we may do that. And so our projections just continued to sort of drop off the table. Our burn rate continued to go up. Uh, and for me, it was a fairly easy call. It was a, a, a team that they had been going for a lot longer. I, uh, I, I needed to step away because there really wasn't much to manage. And so credit to them, they've persevered and they're continuing to go. But I, I knew at that point in time for me, personally, in my journey, it was time to step away. Um, another startup that didn't get quite fully started uh, that I was involved in ran into a bunch of technical hurdles and we didn't have an in-house engineer and some of the really pricey prototype proof of concept stuff we were going to have to pay for uh, was going to be just outside of our friends, family, and fools money uh, and it just wasn't going to work in the market really probably wasn't ready for what we're doing. I'm starting to see companies do some of the similar stuff that we talked about now but I walked away from that a few years ago and again you know, it was one of those situations where we probably can't raise any money, we don't have any revenue coming in, and we're not able to bootstrap it further enough to make make progress. So, those are come up some of my personal experiences, but I want to I want to lend most of the time to, to my panel here to talk about it. And and Patrick, I'm gonna let you sort of introduce yourself and talk maybe a little bit about your personal stories. You know? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'll um, to make this sort of an optimistic story. First of all, my name is Pat Brandon. I will, uh, I will start from our most recent and work backwards because um, the last one's a good story and then it did, you know, it's a, it's a long line of sort of cancellations and um, failures, you might say, before that. Uh, most recently, I've been involved in vehicle tracking startup. Started a company about, uh, I guess, 2007 and uh, just sold it about 18 months ago. I'm still working for the acquirer for a while. Uh, it has worked out very well. It took me seven or eight years uh, putting together a telematics solution for fleets. Not the most original idea in the world. It kind of fell into it like most ideas. Um, and let's just say it's been a pretty good ride. I mean, it's worked out pretty well and it's a pretty simple thing. So let's turn the page back. Um, prior to that, well, how I got into that was coincidentally I failed to start up. Uh, I just say, I will put it in the category, I've seen a thousand of these, maybe not a thousand, I exaggerate, but I'm going to reinvent the world of computing. And I was hired by somebody to go in and help them work out an investment they had made, and I'm going to reinvent the world of computing startup. Uh, needless to say, I, being older and wiser than I was when I first started this business, I looked at that and I said, no you're not. And that actually end up, ended up turning into the business that worked because these guys had, had started a vehicle tracking business. Um, before that, I thought I was going to reinvent the world of computing or this program. And I spent several, I guess a couple of years uh, working on a generative programming 
software startup that uh, is you know, sort of a domain specific language generator. Um, back before it was cool and trying to get that to market. Needless to say, that is um, I work for a CTO of an e book reader company. Uh, for quite a while, I really, it really wasn't my idea or my thing, but it was in the middle of a pretty serious recession. I had to feed my family, so I worked for them. Um, that one tanked. And prior to that, I spent um, three years in a startup I had uh, begun. This was, we're talking 1997 to 2001 time frame with a partner of mine out of business school. Uh, I got an MBA at the University of Virginia, and then immediately after that, I decided, well, you know, the corporate world's not for me, I'm going to do a startup. Um, and I spent three years and most of my life savings on that thing, which then tanked in 2001 when the IPO started going over. So, um, by background, uh, engineer, spent eight years flying in the Navy, flying guests in the Navy, I have some interesting parallels there, but. Um, you know, I've been through a lot of startups, and I've seen, of the ones I've talked about, I, I bet you I know 50 more that have tanked, gone under, quit, whatever you want to say. So I've definitely had some thoughts about that, and, you know, I'd be happy to share them with you. With that sort of, yeah, we'll get into some of those specifics in a second. And I just want to say both of my panelists, when we suggested this topic, jumped at the opportunity. So I'm really, you know, really thrilled that they did. Um, David, why don't you talk a little bit about your? Um, so my story is probably a little bit more simple. It doesn't have as many twists and turns. I, I really only started one great big company, and everything kind of spun up, spun in, and or pivoted out of that. And so um, I ran for almost nine years a company called Busy Event Mobile. And um, we started as a media company before we actually had a product. And our first customer was Domino's Pizza. And Domino's actually defined our first product, which was the mobile product, prior to actually being mobile technology. And so we um, developed audience response technology, live event management technology. Um, and it was in the space where my business partner and I came from. So uh, I won't tell the whole story that led up to my partner and I starting this company, uh, but he and I were working together in the space, and we kind of did what a typical entrepreneurs do, which is, well, we're smarter than our bosses, so we can probably do this better, and we could certainly make more money doing it because all of the dumb salespeople who are selling this stuff and make and we're the ones developing it, right? They're making all the money, and so why don't we? Why don't we put something together? Why don't we figure this out? And we did. And we um, we actually raised. Um, I think by the end we raised 3.4 million dollars. Um, we did that over over the course of several rounds of near miss development, meaning we developed a bunch and we continued to get our money kind of just in time um, to keep things rolling. Um, there were a number of times when we were we would, were missing payroll. There were a number of times when we certainly didn't pay ourselves, and there were a number of times when my wife said to me, what the hell are you doing? Um, How many times? <laughs> well, I remember one time in particular where she, she, she said to me, she goes, I don't know if I should threaten to leave you, if that would actually work. <laughs> um, so in terms of no when to run, <laughs> Or no one to quit. What is this thing called? Yeah, when to walk away. No one to walk away. Or no no one to run. run. Yeah. yeah, there's a Kenny Rogers. No one to hold them. <laughs> um, in hindsight, I think there was a point. So again, this event lasted for nine years. At one point, we were employing ten people, and our our monthly burn rate was about um, 120k per month. So we we grew to be something fairly large, fairly fast. Because um, we thought every one of our customers was going to look like Domino's Pizza. Because holy cow, we landed Domino's, right? Um, Domino's was the biggest and only big customer we ever had. And we, we geared up pretty quick. Um, there was a point, again, it, there was nine years. So at about five years, um, I remember sitting down with my then CEO and chief, um, chief board member and said, um, I think we're going to die. I think it's probably time to shut it down. And he agreed with me. It was five years. That was in five years. <laughs> he 
and I don't know, I really don't remember the course of, of actions that happened back then because it was a bit of a blur. I think it involved me liquidating my 401k because I wasn't willing to quit. And it was about the same time the market tumbled a bit. I'm trying to think. So we started in 06. When did the market really like crap out? 08. Oh, yeah. So this might have been this might have been 08 when I liquidated my 401k because I did it like a week before the market fell apart. And I remember getting a call from my investment guy saying, "How did you know?" <laughs> and I said, well, "What do you mean? How did I know?" And he goes, "The market just tanked." I go, "Well, I don't know. I didn't have any money in it." <laughs> he goes, well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, so talk talk a little bit about those signs, right? So you you got to that point, and Patrick jumped in here as well. Like, what are those what are those moments, right? Because entrepreneurs are are you know throwing caution to the wind in general, right? You're you're going against percentages and odds, you know, of ever succeeding. You've already been told all the facts and the factors about it. who makes it and how many. I have a strong opinion on this. Yeah. What 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 really moved the needle for you in terms of this is, this is here, so here's here, here to me is I think the core paradigm of of someone who's who, who defines themselves as an entrepreneur. That's someone who has tenacity, grit, who's scrappy, I mean fill in all the words, right? None of those words describe someone who would ever quit. And, 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 and why would you? I mean, you've defied all odds to have a company that's lasted for X months, years, or whatever otherwise. Because you know what the stats are on startups that fail. And once you make it past that, you're like, hooray, we made it past that. Now we, we must be getting somewhere. But the problem is, you don't, ever, you don't ever die. You just kind of limp. You know, and so that's that's the problem. Is if you don't if you don't take off like a rocket, then then are you a failure? And you're like, no, of course not, because we're employing people, we have an office, we're paying ourselves. It's kind of a lifestyle business, but it's getting somewhere. And you convince yourself that quitting's not the right thing to do because if you can just go six more months, or if you can just get to the next thing, there's always that next milestone, and somehow you keep hitting them, and therefore you're being rewarded for what might be the wrong behavior. And because you're in it, and you're fully invested in it, why would you quit? Why, how could you possibly quit? Yeah, well, I had a, it's interesting because I, you know, I went to the University of Virginia, Darden, and, and one of my professors at Darden was a guy named John Glenn, not me, but he's an, he was a guy out of the valley, and, um, you know, one of the VCs out there. He says, you know, it's easy with the ones that fail, or the ones that do well, it's like the ones that drive you nuts are what he called the walking dead. Yeah. 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 They just go on. There's always another day. There's always another hope. There's always another sale. Yeah. There's always something. And that is definitely, that's what happens. And I would say where you got exactly where I was. You, the key words, define yourself. I don't want to get all philosophical, but if you define yourself by your business, you're a cruising for a prison. You know? It, your idea and your business are not you, you know, and you sit there and you got these people working for you, you're an entrepreneur, you've raised millions of dollars from borders, you got half of the front page of the marketplace, you know, the Wall Street marketplace, I mean, we were, I was on CNBC, you know, they're interviewing me, they're, you know, the whole nine yards, I'm sitting there, you know, getting dinner requests from the money honey, and, you know, it's like at some point, it's like the business is not you. You know, I had I had a meeting like three months into my first startup out of business school, and it was like that guy just laid out. It was I can't remember the guy's name. But he was like, "Sign a work, and here's one." And he was dead on. I'm telling you, he was like 90 days into it. Yeah. Dead on. But you know, there's we also talked to 120 other gray-haired, rich business guys, and it's very rare that you get a guy who a person. Is like who can get out of their own experience, right? right? And translate, well, you know what, you were a lucky MF. Right. You right. know, that's the reality. Yeah. And it's very rare to find an advisor who can get out of that space and yeah. say, let me tell you, here's why it's going to be difficult. I hear that a lot. Luck, it's luck's a big part of this. I mean, to hear that from advisors, you know, it's easy to maybe dismiss that as sort of fluff, but that seems to be really yeah, critical. You can't know. You can't know, right. right? It's like the, book, the innovator's dilemma. I don't know how many of the best, best entrepreneurship book ever written. You know, you can't, if, you, if it was knowable and planable, right. you wouldn't be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Just, can you use right. like three minutes of what, what was your product predominant? So, um, 
I came from the live event space. Trade shows, um, concert tours, mall tours, music tours, comedy tours, live events. And um, being in the live event space, I recognized that there was a tremendous amount of registration, information, on-site experience, the big grab bag full of crap swag that you get by walking around the trade show floor. So we built an electronic system to collect all that information and process you through the front door. And it was a big data play before anybody even talked about big data. So we we had a market by the tail before it even was a market, before Cvent, before Double Dutch, before any of these big app companies even existed. We were building this. We had an amazing idea and we were able to raise a bunch of money because people saw the idea was going to be huge. We were never well enough capitalized to make a position in the market. We had an amazing idea, we were almost ahead of the curve, ahead of the game, and we just couldn't gain our traction fast enough. We were a lifestyle business. We could have been a lifestyle business forever. So you took that registration concept, like you go to a trade show, and put it to down those people there. We ran their ginormous trade event for 6,000 people, and we did a whole bunch of their smaller training events. Same time, so it was a software-based system for registration and all kinds of events. And yes, sir, your product was so. Like my first crack was we built a an on-demand book. This is 1997. We built a system that would produce a book on demand within 10 minutes or less in a bookstore. The name of the business was Sprout. Maybe two of these tables. Like you would order a latte now for some walk up to say a bookstore. There were still bookstores then. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, there were still bookstores and you'd walk up and you say, I want X, Y, or Z, and they would produce it and hand it to you, usually in five minutes or less. So they print it, find it, and yeah, and it came it was the same as any quality paperback. Oh, cool. So, so, so my image. question is this. So uh, ITIN has uh, about a business model and that's great. So was the fact that you guys had Walking Dead that finally died because you were maybe hitting milestones, but maybe milestones of raising capital as opposed to, you know, getting customers and making the traction that made it success? Okay. I don't my, know if that question makes my, sense. Um, yeah, what, what, so my partner in the business was a guy from Manhattan who knew everyone. Like we've had multiple, multiple meetings with Michael Bloomberg. We had, you know, he could introduce me to anybody on the planet, right? And so that was handy, you know. So like, hey, I'd like to meet Mike Fluber. Bam, meet him, right? Uh, so that was really handy, and you know, we talked to a lot of people, and we got investment from Borders. We got like, and you know, we got a big chunk of publicity on the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and you just step from success to success to success, you know. In my mind, I'm a very analytical guy. I really realized very uh, very early that there was a core problem with business. Right? It was going to be very difficult to rectify. But right? I mean, we knew that within, like I said, 90 days of getting out of business school and starting this thing together, we knew there was a really tough problem, which was the basic problem was retailers didn't want a book production unit unless there was a ton of content on it. The publisher didn't want to give us the content unless we had a ton of retail. So in that vein, how do you reconcile that? You know, like when you're when there's disagreements among your investors, board, yeah. co-founders, management team, and in your gut maybe you feel a certain way. I mean, either one of you can jump in on this. Do you yeah. suppress it? Do you just show, you know soldier on, or uh, you know, or what would you do? Tend to today? ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. Teamwork is pop is is like powerful. You know, human beings are social. Yeah. Like we get into this, and we, you know, we spend all our hours and working on this. It's it's really a difficult psychological thing to say. Yeah, you know, hey, see you later. Like we're done, right? And the reality is, you're, the likelihood of you both coming to that conclusion, or the three of you at the same time, it's pretty small. I right? I had a I had a somewhat different experience. Um, I don't want to ignore the rest of your question though, so I will I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, because you asked a very specific question about the value of I10, and and. And getting through the process, uh, I mean, we were, I think we were maybe the second or third that passed yeah, through the, the Mock Angel program. Oh, we pitched amazingly. I, I bet I pitched 200 times, 
and we raised three point four million dollars. So do the math. I mean, every time I pitched, I got sixteen grand, right? Something like that. But if you could get sixteen grand every time you pitched a room, would you do it? I mean, it didn't really work out like that. But, I mean, that's a good average. They, they polished us up. They, I mean, we did Capital Innovators. Before that, we were I ten. I mean. We, we were the poster child for what you're supposed to do to run through and use all your resources in St. Louis. We said yes to everything, and everything said yes to us, and, and we worked hard. And um, there's no joke that it takes a month per slide to perfect your pitch, because we had 26 slides, and my wife's like, why don't you just have 10 slides? That would take less time. <laughs> <laughs> so 10 slides we got. <laughs> Thank you, Guy Kawasaki. What was your different take on the music of the yeah, the, the different take was um, was confusing consensus for leadership. So um, I thought that for us to move forward, my business partner and I had to agree. But in reality, one of us needed to be a leader, and one of us needed to go along. And it took us many years to reconcile that until we finally came to an agreement that one of us needed to start running and the other one just needed to fall in behind and draft. And when we did that, good things started happening. The problem was, a lot of what we did that was good was too late. We released the most amazing piece of software and shut the company down 60 days later. Because an amazing opportunity, uh, a client that was in line to basically buy us and or fund us, backed out in the 11th hour. So we were either going to close the deal of our lifetime or have a, uh, a nice exit. And that company, through acquisitions and other means, found another, another alternative to our technology. And at that point, I went to the board and said, this is officially a lifestyle business, and I did not sign up for this lifestyle any longer. We need to shut the company down. Because this deal that we were about to close, which everybody was like praying and wishing and hoping for, it didn't happen, and I didn't have the energy any longer to go try to find another one. We put so many eggs in that basket, which is a huge mistake. But we had no reason to believe we weren't going to get the deal. They were already they were already using our technology almost exclusively in one area of their business. So we we did everything right. We built everything. We grew everything. We listened to everybody. We pivoted. We molded. We were not egotistical. We did not read our own press. And it's just, at the end of the day, it was just bad luck. So, comedy's been defined as tragedy plus time, right? So, as time passes, are you gaining, do you think about it at all? Or are you gaining new perspectives on it, or is it in the rear view and it's just moving forward? I mean, I'm, I'm very happy about the experience that I had. I mean, am I happy that I put it in my 401k when I did? At the, at the end of the day, it probably doesn't much matter. But I got, I got what I call my poor man's MBA. I got, I got experience that you could never possibly get in a university setting. And that experience actually landed me a dream job. I mean, what I do today, I'm a business innovation consultant for a division of worldwide technology. I work for Asynchrony Labs, and I love the job that I found. And I found it actually through somebody I met in the process of running my company. So I mean, the networking and the connections and how I found my way to this position that I have now, doing something I love doing and I'm happy came because of my experience that I had as a startup. And everything that I use in my daily job comes from the entrepreneurial experiences that I had. So I don't have any regrets for where I am today. Obviously I regret that I didn't have some massive liquidity event. I mean, who doesn't want to get a whole stack of money for nine years of really hard work? But I'm healthy, I'm here, I'm happy. My wife's happy again because I'm gainfully employed. Um, she didn't leave me, she stayed with me, and she also, by the way, said, if you do something else entrepreneurial, I will leave you. <laughs> she said, so get a job. And I'm glad that I did. That, so You said some of your goods kind of led to some of your now current successes. Right? Yes. Yeah, so talk about Fox Tracks, because I know there were times of desperation there too, right? What was the difference? Yeah, the first. I was pretty stubborn for the first 18 months, and then, uh, actually that one was pretty easy. Once I got over the, once I got over the idea that like fleet owners wanted to track um, their vehicles with a handset, and again, it's like, this is like my big piece, but I'll get to you in a second, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, 
um, it's like, I don't think it's, I think if it's really hard, like if your startup idea is really hard, you may need to go home and have a hard think. Fox tracks are pretty easy. Hmm. It worked, we had a product, people bought it, it grew, and we made money. And like the margins were fantastic. You know, and some things went wrong on the way. Now Sprout, the book thing, oh my God. You talk about pulling teeth. That thing was, oh, <laughs> everything about it was hard. And I knew it right away, yeah. right? I mean, we knew it and you sit there because you're obligated to your friends and your family and you just can't, you know, you personally, we take ourselves so damn seriously, right? It's like I should have, like, in the first summer, I said, well, you know, I had an idea, it was bad, Trust move the on. Intuition. Right? And, I mean, that's me. I mean, but once I got, once I let go, like, I had one bad idea, started Fox Friends. And once I let go of that, it just, you know, I'm some sorry, you were, there. you were asking? It was, yeah, I was curious about one thing that seemed to be in common with both your stories in regard, and that's, you did a lot of asks and you kept coming in the last second, you finally got some, you got a milestone. And one thing that occurs to me, because like especially the paradigm that seems to dominate a lot of venture capital now, is this lean model, try to kick and half starve every startup so you don't lose too much, which is great for the investors to a degree, but makes most of the good models fail. If you had enough money to do it right, you guys would have kicked ass. <laughs> right? That's what basically you're saying, assuming your judgment is correct. So your investors screwed up by not bothering to make sure you could survive to pay them off. It's easy to the say first now. half. It's easy to say now. Well, no, I'm just saying is what my, my question is really, you know, there was a question about <laughs> was, and you would sprout, you realize you had a massive business issue, and unless you had a lot of money and time to work on it, you couldn't possibly get it coordinated. And so the question then is, is it maybe that when we're trying to set up something or put together our capitalization, do we need to get a little more hardcore about a better ask? and more realistic amount of fudge money, et cetera, to survive and do it right. And if we can't get that, use that as a better measure rather than, well, I need enough to hire a guy and survive and give it a shot and then I can dream. Instead of saying, you know, you know what? No, if I'm really gonna have a chance and not waste a year or two, I gotta have I'll, enough to I'll get- give you my, I'll give you my, my what, I, what I tell people now. So I, I mentor quite a few startups now and I get asked a lot, you know, what's the simple path? Because I, I, I will say I will say to the people, so let me, quick poll of audience. Who here has a startup today? Raise your hand. Who here is thinking about starting a business and doesn't start one yet? <laughs> okay. So of the people who have a startup, who has had that startup for more than five years? Well, is it the two people with their hands up are people I know. Okay, well that's how <laughs> So people I don't recognize, their startups are fairly new. Okay. I think the problem isn't the investors giving enough money. I think the problem is we as the keeper of the idea don't know how to develop a minimum viable product. We talk ourselves into something that's bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger rather than validating a small parcel of our idea in the market and only growing when adoption has raised to a level that's sustainable. I did this quite by accident in the final months of my company. I actually started a second company waiting for our product to develop called My Compliance Wizard. It was a very simple research project. It cost about $10,000 to build. And it's actually a cash flow positive business that runs today. And we actually might have an exit for that. We have three different companies that are looking at it. It won't be a lot of money. It might be a quarter million dollars. But it worked. I had forgotten, I will tell you, I had forgotten what a startup was really like. I was so knee deep in the big thing that was big funded over the period of time that I'd forgotten that startups don't have to be big at the beginning. They don't ever have to be big, frankly. But they have to be cash flow positive. You cannot trade cash flow for dreams. You cannot trade market adoption for what you think might happen or the next deal you might get. You don't have the business, you don't have the cash, you don't have the positive response from the market space, then die. Don't take nine years to die. Pivot, move on, do something different. I, I didn't do it. And I, I, it took me to the very, almost the very end to, to remember what a startup and how to form a startup really was supposed to be. Pat, what do you think about that? You, you've raised money in other markets as well, so what do you think? Um, 
I don't know that I have a ton to add. I think I've seen, I'll tell you what I've seen a lot of examples of is people raising crazy valuations. Mm -hmm. And then investors cooperate and they, you know, they put a convertible note in there, or they put X, Y, or Z in, and that is a trap. It's just a, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You may have the greatest idea in the world, but if you don't have revenue and you're not cash flow positive, cash flow positive you're not worth much. You're sport bag. And, and you know, if you go in and you raise money, it, Realistically, in, in traditional business logic, as many multiples of what you'd be worth if you were a hamburger shop or something like that, you need to seriously think about, wow, this money is at a, at a, at a big premium. Well, what's going to happen? Either you're going to live up to that. Maybe you're Google. Maybe you're whatever. Right. You're probably not. Right. Um, and now there's going to be the right time. There's going to be the adjustment. That's going to be really painful. It's going to be very, very painful. And I've, I, there's countless guys I've seen like that. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah you're worth $20 million in pre revenue. And it's like, I, mean, I hope I'm not boring anyone's ox here, but it's like, um, <laughs> you're not. Do. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe you're a genius. Maybe you have, maybe you're curing cancer. And maybe you're this, that, or other. The reality is, if you can't go out and sell the thing pretty quick, if you can't find a customer willing to write you a check for a thing you have, um, you should probably not be looking for more money than you're worth, unless you're willing to you know, deal with it, right? Because it, it just, it, it snowballs, right? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's rare. Other questions from the panel, all right? Yeah, one here. Uh, a question. Um, I, I worked in investing, getting some money in New York, in the New York market, my financial uh, startup. Um, I have a brother that was involved in a startup in the West Coast. And we always talked about the different cultures. My question is, it seems like there's a third culture, like here, compared to, you know, you say it's not the investors. I think it is. I think the investors don't understand the West Coast mentality about failure. I mean, it's just, so I think that, I think there is a reality there that has to be addressed. What's the, what's the reality you're talking about? Expand on that a little bit. Well, I think, I think, I mean, the money, the investors, how conservative are the investors? How much are they willing well, to I'll take the risk? I'll say this, I got a million dollars here faster. Like that. Faster than what? At, at Atlanta, and when I was working in New York, and, and maybe it was a business idea, maybe it was what it was, but I, I, I think we beat, I think St. Louis is a pretty damn good place to start a business in a lot of ways. I mean, our biggest problem is, is if your IT is finding programmers. But, but, but I raise money faster here than, and, and I'm just saying it's an alternate experience. So I what is the fast. culture of the investor in St. Louis? I can answer that. I feel like, sure. And from my experience, um, I was so I was the CEO of a company of three people. How ridiculous is that? Um, when I, <laughs> the, the concept of the CEO of anything, right? Like, yeah, which part? Which, which part? part? Ridiculous. <laughs> All of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I had a I had a mentor, um, a, what I call a lunchtime mentor. I would buy lunch, and he would he would help me. Who um, who ran CPI Photo for 25 years? His name was Alan. His name is Alan Esman. And Alan had the Rolodex. Alan had the contacts. Um, he was respected, and no one was going to invest in a company where I was the CEO. Because what had I done? So the the, the, the first difficult decision I made was to get out of the way and let Alan be the CEO and chairman of the board. And when I did that, we started getting money. You need to get your first yes. So Alan was the first yes, and then Alan got some of his friends to say yes, and then we had our first bit of momentum. In St. Louis, you have to get momentum is what I'm saying. So you have 24 PowerPoints, or whatever the number, 24 months, 24 PowerPoints. Where, where is the decision making in the due diligence of the investor looking at the idea and saying, where's my, where's my return on investment? It's the follow-on. It's the, so we, we raised our first $600,000 purely on our own from angels. Prior to there being any capital innovators or I-10 or VMS or any of it, it didn't exist in 2006 and 7. It was just getting started. I remember having a bowl of soup with Jim Bersunas yeah. before it even started. It was well before. And the so, formation of the investment group. So here. here's what happened. When we got our first, so we almost didn't even get into this. We were like the 13th presenter in Capital Innovators Class 2. 
It was like we were filling a slot that didn't exist. We got $50,000 and the nod from Capital Innovators and got polished up for our pitch day. That yes got us a whole bunch of more yeses from Bill and Angels. Um, Stiefel got involved in our deal through relationships and helped us craft our deal. One yes begets other yeses. That's my point. St. Louis, I don't want to make this sound negative, but St. Louis is a follower's market. You have to get your first couple of yeses, and they have to be qualified yeses. So I mean, those of you that are wanting to raise money, I'm giving you the key to raise money. I'm telling you, go get the first yes. Give up whatever you have to give up to get the yes. I don't really care how much your business you think it's worth. Give away 40% if you have to give away 40%, but get the qualified yes, because from there, your valuation is going to go do, 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 up, 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 as long as you have a business in cash flow. I think what he's hitting on is something that's a and oh, that sure. is the ecosystem as it turns yeah. into and the mentality. And we heard it earlier in Jim's uh, unit, right? And he gave the numbers, and I don't know if anybody's doing the math, but I knew the numbers already. There aren't very many deals done through our changes. There aren't very many deals done through both of There aren't very many deals done in St. Louis in general at the seed stage. So then don't go raise money. No, no, cash flow so my business. Point is, it's not a startup friendly. Everybody, and I'll tell you, I've had 30 meetings in the last two weeks on schedule. I'll be very transparent. And I swear, 29 of the people said to me, when you guys launch the product and you prove conversion, I'll give you the money. You won't need it then. And my point to them is, three weeks ago in San Francisco, Kleiner Perkins said, uh, you, when you get, you launch, and you get those customers I've identified, and you prove a conversion of 3%, these guys are saying 10%, miners at 3%, we think you should raise 15 million. And this person, I said to this person, can you, can you write me a check for 15 million? That was, that became my standard answer in the last two weeks. Can you write a check for 15 million? You can participate then. If you want to write a check for $50,000, the time is now. Yeah. It's like, no, you can't have those same qualifications. Another example, I moderated a panel in this room, and at one end was the guy from Bank of America. He said his criteria for investment, and at the end of it he said, and so uh, my rate, what I expect in return, is, um, is the prime plus three. And it got all the way down through all the other people, and it got to uh, somebody from the major group in town, and his statement was, here are my criteria. And then he said, but I'm looking for at least a 10-inch return. So afterwards, I said to him, wait a minute, you had the same requirements, only I'm giving you equity, and you want, to tell, and you want the money off the top first. He goes, yeah, that's right. Like, I'm going to Bank of America. If I'm already at that provable point, I'm going to Bank of America. Sorry. But what we need in St. Louis is, uh, and I refer to the Krebs cycle because I have a health science back. You don't have big fish without bream and little fish, right? <laughs> that Krebs cycle, that cycle of life requires the Krebs cycle. So requires checking on that. I mean, you mentioned it, you know, starting a new business and just going cash flow positive and not really caring about the exit, right? Right. But getting excited about that idea, of delivering value and getting paid on that. Is that a common thought for you guys? Do you guys is that one of those lessons learned from previous failures that you're not thinking of, like an investor at this point. And, and if you were to do a next venture, and for the sake of your marriage, let's just say you're not. But if, <laughs> if, if, if you were, uh, is that one of those things that if I had to do again, out of so months? I can I can give a short answer, and then I, use, I yeah. feel like I've been dominating here for the past few minutes. Um, if I had it to do again, I would do it just like I, I recently did. I would develop a simple cash flow positive business, get feedback from the market find out what they're willing to pay for, and continue to build that, which is what we're on track to do. And I've paused, I've paused that business because I'm, I'm, in, I'm engaged in something else. When someone comes along and says, I want to, I want to buy that or I want to invest in that, I'm gonna, I'm, my responsibility to my board is to get rid of the 55% ownership we have in that, in that deal, and consult out of it, and watch it, watch it grow under someone else's care. And it might suck if I find out that this really awesome idea turns out to be a multi-million dollar thing that I watched go away. But I learned a valuable lesson. And I, you asked about investment. Everybody wants their idea to scale. Everybody wants to take their little idea and talk about how amazingly big it's going to be. 
and they conveniently skip over the steps that will get them there, and the answer is not a bunch of money. That, that would be your previous values have led to a change in your thought process. I think it's exactly at the same point where I would be like, my leash uh, and how quick can I make money? How quick do I have revenue and happy customers paying for a product is pretty short now. Sure. That's sure. It's sure. Yeah, it's sure. Because, you know, I'm going to have another idea. Right. I'll go home after this, you know. I'll, right. I'll like have dinner or whatever and there will be another idea. Right, and I can guarantee that, or maybe a week later or something like that, I'll have, you know, and so I've got a really short leash to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I think we have a problem with the definition of startup. Because you can only raise money when you cash flow positive. My definition of a startup is you're a startup until you're a viable entity. If you're cash flow positive, you're a viable entity, you're not starting. You're not starting. So that's the crep cycle problem, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, and you got to define short leash got everything yeah. else but you know I saw him three years of my life in a sprout and uh, all burned all my life savings you know and the only reason I got out was we started having babies right and so I'm like shit pay the bills <laughs> and uh, I wasn't going anywhere and I finally acknowledged reality which had been staring me in the face for at least two and a half years um, I don't I honestly I, I'll, I'll be honest I don't think the funding situation in St. Louis is that bad I've done the West Coast routine a bunch been there. Now it's been a while. I've got a lot of contacts. I I think uh, you, you know the archangels aren't the whole universe. You better reach out because there is a lot of old money here. There's yeah. a lot of people. Right. There's a lot of people who invest and they will put money in. And you know if you're stuck on an idea that's having a hard time funding, maybe you can go back and think about the idea. Let's let's move on from the investment. Other questions that people might have for you. So I'm kind of curious about. You know, part okay. So, if your vision, I'm wondering if you saw the exit in the beginning. Like, for example, like you were saying, you know, you didn't want to be a lifestyle business. You knew that from the beginning, and you saw sort of the exit point. No, I could have been a lifestyle business if the lifestyle were better. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like Richard Branson. Fair enough. <laughs> That's a good point. Well, so, but, I'm sorry. Ask me a question. Well, so part of me is like. And then I've been, by the way, I've been given this advice from the mentors and I've So that's a good thing, right? To try to get cash flow positive, right? And start out and then, and, and there even, but, but then it's like, okay, and, and what's, then what's next and what's next after that? And well, cash, well, cash flow positive. Well, so your milestones, though, you were hitting those milestones, you said, but then they weren't quite enough. So I'm wondering, is it a rethinking of the milestones or did you not think far enough? Did you not think big enough? We, we just screw too fast. I think we, we got ahead of ourselves a little bit. We, we expanded and contracted a few times. I mean, there was, again, it's too long a story. How do you tell a nine-year story without boring an audience? So I mean, we actually restarted the company at some point. We actually hit the reset button, clear our staff, because they were incapable of developing modern mobile applications, even though we gave them a chance. We made sure they had got jobs. We didn't like say goodbye, and it was done gracefully. But we reset the company at one point. I mean, in, in that regard, we actually had two startups that were named Busy Event. Because the first one was Big Iron.net SQL, and the second one was built on AngularJS. So, I mean, we had two very different architectures. So, it wasn't, a, I wouldn't call it pivot, I would call it we hit the hard reset button. And we grew too fast. Another question in the back, let make sure. Okay, so you said uh, three years, you said nine years for your company, right? Now, I'm pretty sure you guys aren't idiots, and you guys did this oh, hang on to this. Don't give me that long. So, you saw that there were some things working, and that was the reason why you kept going. So, when did you realize that those things that were working weren't working enough? Mine was a simple story. We, our, our, our best customer slash exit fell apart. And at that point, I'm like, I can't go on any further. I can't continue to, to be scrappy and good at I'm all out of dance moves. <laughs> so that, that was an easy decision for me. That was you answer. That. So mine was uh, like the early spring of 2001. For a brief moment, I was worth tens of millions of dollars on paper. Because we had a term sheet from the bottom, you know, I would say that to myself. Um, I had all sorts of make-believe friends. <laughs> 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 I had a term sheet from a big VC to remain unnamed, and then the first IPO started crashing. 
and uh, all of a sudden a manufactured reason came along to yank the IPO or yank the uh, term sheet. And so the business shut down, right? I mean, we'd been at it three years. I'd expended my savings. We were entering the, you know, let's just call it the uh, 2001, 2000, 2001 recession. And uh, yeah, it was just a bubble. All that stuff in the 90s, just a bubble, right? I mean, it was over. We were overheated. The internet was a neat, right? It was really neat. And people got overheated and then it blew up. Had a family. And, you know, realistically, uh, it was a good thing because it wouldn't have worked. And it gave me time to like sit and think about it. Because I just had to go get a job for a while. Right? I'm like, I got, you know, two kids. I got to get a job. I got to pay for my family. I got to do the rest of this stuff. And it sort of all digested. And I sort of depersonalized the whole episode. And it moved on. But, you know, in me, it was like it was hitting a brick wall. And it was pure luck that I did. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I failed. And, you know. It's like then it kind of came back and I did more, and one of them eventually worked. Right. Yeah. So my more comment, I'm just the, in my opinion, that's all it is at the end of the day. David is exactly right. The and I'm going back to this one topic. The one thing that I see as a common failure of startups in St. Louis is if only something, and that usually manifests itself around. If only you would pay attention to my really sexy idea, never mind that I haven't been able to prove to you that I can operationalize it in any way, shape, or form, but if you only gave me the money to do that, then I could make that happen. And the thing is, if you look at it from the investor's perspective, that's just not realistic. It's just not. Good comment. Other questions? Comments from the audience? And I have one thing, Patrick, you mentioned a couple times that process of depersonalization, right? Mm -hmm. That you gotta, that A, your advisors gave you, uh, the one that was able to just cut through all the noise, and then B, your real, uh, realization that like you had to just decouple yourself from the situation. Um, how hard is that to do though? Because I mean, if it's your idea and your baby, right? I mean, David, yeah. I, I saw you guys sort of fully invested in this, so you both come on, but you mentioned that term. How, how hard is that process? So, does it take a life event like, Got kids, got bills. Yeah, got I, don't, I don't know. I mean, honestly, it just happened. Yeah. Right. It just happened to me. There was a lot of stuff going on. The thing tanked. I had to do what I had to do to, you know, make my obligations. And um, then I had to think about it for <laughs> several years while I did other things. And it just happened. Right. Yeah. And, and I, as I, the, the process I got to was, well, that was a bad idea. You know, yeah. Fundamentally, I worked three years on a bad idea. And let's move on. I think the whole is it difficult or not is is to me not like not really a, it just happens. Yeah. 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 yeah, I feel like I've covered it. Yeah. The only other thing, the only other image I would give you is you know, we got to this place where it's almost like the high school dance towards the end. And everybody's kind of pairing off, and you're up, you're off the floor, you're looking around, you're going, there's 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 not that many people left to dance with. Like who am I going home with, right? And that was that was the reality. There was we were in a market that had very heavy consolidation very quickly. I, I don't expect that many of you know about the, the, the live event technology space, but CVent has gobbled up everyone, and they suck. They're the worst software, and they gobbled up good. They gobbled up good software just so they could kill it, and that was the market we were in. And I, I, I mean, I, it happened so fast. Yeah, that's the other, the other point I would make that I discovered in vehicle traction. When you get into an idea at the right time and it starts working, go with your gut. Man, you better put everything you have in it. Because Accelerator, yeah. We could, you know, we did fine. Right, we did fine. But boy, you see it and it's going and you just, you almost can't believe it. Right? It's like, holy shit. You know, this thing is going. You know, and, and uh, it's, it's just, it's almost like you're in this, like this passion, and this thing is a, this thing's an experiment, it might not work, this might not work, we'll take it a step at a time, we'll wait for the next thing, and then all of a sudden st something starts hitting, and you got to realize, you know, it's kind of like fishing, hey, there's something on the line. Exactly. Yeah, you right? better hope you hold on, right? Yeah, yeah, you better start paying attention, right? And so, it's, you know, if it's a David and Goliath thing, 
That is a story that only happened one time, by the way. If you think that you're going to be David and you're going to slay Goliath, your chances of that happening, I mean, you can be the most faith-filled person that we've ever known or met, but you are not going to slay Goliath. Yeah, and the point, I forgot my punchline here, maybe a beer or two. <laughs> um, but the point I make is, like, in today's world, if you have something that's going and it's going fast, boy, the gap closes fast. Yeah. And it's like there is someone behind you, like, or, I mean, you, you look back, there's like a pack of people behind you. That's why you need cash flow. Uh, you know, you may not even be in the front, but there's like, you know, and somewhere way back there is some giant bull running after you. And he may be slow, but when he gets there, you're going to get trampled. We're going to go with one so, last one. So it sounds to me like you're saying that, in fact, you never walk away. You only get pushed out. Have you, do you have any stories of individuals that you have seen them at some point walk away from their baby and said, I can't believe that he or she is doing this, but in retrospect, that person really saw the writing on the wall before everybody else did. Well, I, it was I, the right choice. I walked away. I mean, I wasn't dead broke yet. I was just like, I was tired. I was exhausted. I walked away from my, I didn't even go into my whole generative programming. You know, I walked away from that. I walked away from a um, sort of an e-reader startup that I was CTO for. And I'm like, that's not going anywhere. So yeah, I've, I've walked away. I mean, in my mind, I've walked away from three. And I remember back, so I was in the Navy. I told you I was in the Navy for like eight years. And I flew in the Gulf War. And the Navy's gotten pretty smart, right, about how they do things versus some other militaries. And you know, one of the things they say when you're in that jet and you're about to do something really stupid, you go, like, live to fight another day. Right? You're going to win the war. I mean, you're the U.S. Navy and that's a wrap. You're going to win unless some politician causes you to lose. You're going to win. It's like, live to fight another day. And they would tell us that every day. Live to fight another day. Okay, don't go full speed. Uh, you know, that's why like, just don't. Yeah, okay. Someone's not working, why? I'm, I'm going to back off. You know, when you're young, you're stupid. So it takes a while to figure out you're about to die. And then you get older and you're like, it's not working. Right? You learn quicker and quicker. And that's just, you know, if you're a learning, you're thinking first. And that's where you get. But yeah, you walk away. And, well, and, and here's the problem. Here's the problem with being young and stupid. Is when you're young and someone tells you, gives you like what seems like sage advice, you're, if you're like a true grit entrepreneur, your first thought is, that will never happen to me. I'm going to do it differently. And then when it happens to you, you're like, shit, why didn't I listen to that guy? Because he knew. Yeah. And, I, and I recall back at the time when someone, some, some person would say to me, you don't have this, you don't have that, you're going to fail. That's not going to happen to me. And because and, and the true entrepreneur in you says, I'm going to persevere. And that is, the, that is the crux of this challenge of walking away, is you believe that your fate's going to be different. And there's a good chance it could be. So why wouldn't you gamble on yourself? Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking David.